Great. So uh, welcome, everybody, to the uh, next installment of the uh, Admiral Markets Trading Spotlight uh, webinar. My name is Paul. I'm here to uh, welcome you. Thank you for all joining us. We appreciate uh, here at Admiral Markets that it's been a rather uh, eventful year. Uh, we hope that you're all uh, home safe and uh, well. And we thank you for being able to join us today's session where we're going to talk all about you know what happens now after the uh, U.S presidential uh, inauguration which happened last week so if you just bear with us a moment what we'll do is uh, i will uh, um, we'll bring up the the, the, the slides uh, and we'll look to where uh, we'll look to crack on Super. So here we have the US presidential inauguration. And the question becomes, well, what next? How do we turn this into uh, an opportunity? So it's uh, been a rather uh, eventful few months, okay, in both the run up to the US election, then the, let's say, the, the squabbles around the sort of uh, validity of the US election. And then last week we had the. What happens next? So um, here we are, Admiral Markets, a, uh, a sort of kind of a multi-domain broker that has uh, is licensed and regulated across a wide range of regulatory environments, providing competitive spreads on the most uh, popular trading products, uh, allowing you the opportunity to engage with markets using both MT4 and MT5 platform. If you have any questions about Admiral Markets, please get in touch with your account representative and they'll be very happy to help you. So as I said, Mr. Biden was inaugurated as the uh, next US president on the 20th of January, just last week. And we're all interested to know, you know, what happens now? What actually kind of changes are we going to see, not only in the US, but actually across the world? And, and that is actually what I'm going to sort of focus on, not just literally, you know, what, what actually has happened in the US, but I'm going to sort of take a bigger, broader view of what, what sort of kind of changes we might see over the next sort of, you know, five to 10 years. Because in very, this, is, this is a shift, okay? This is a switch, not only in in the, uh, in the state of US politics, but in terms of the whole sort of global vision. Uh, and not unsurprisingly, because, you know, we're, we're traders, we'll talk a little bit about how is this going to affect markets? What can actually we expect to see happening? And uh, we'll talk about, well, how do we turn this into an opportunity for us? Because <clears throat> if there's anything we've learned over the last year, okay, you know, all sorts of unexpected things can happen. Uh, and it's really down to you to sort of the individual to understand, you know, is this a threat or is this an opportunity? And so we'll have a little look at what we can do to make this an opportunity for you. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name's uh, uh, Paul. I've traded for, for many years, okay, and coached uh, hundreds and thousands of traders uh, down the years. Uh, primarily, I like to sort of focus on trading FX indices and commodities on a sort of a longer term uh, trend trading basis. Uh, and then I tend to be a reversal and mean reversion trader for sort of shorter term intraday trading. So the US presidential inauguration, okay. So uh, undoubtedly, some of you will have watched that on the uh, the television, wherever you are in the world. I, I always appreciate that we have a, a broad range of experience of people in the room, just from complete beginners to, to people who've been trading for maybe decades. OK, uh, and, and also we recognize that we have a truly global audience here. So, you know, but I'm sure wherever you are in the world, you'll have been aware of the uh, inauguration of uh, President Biden last week on Wednesday, 20th of January. Uh, and what we also saw in the US was the inauguration of the first female vice president in Kamala Harris. Uh, and I think in terms of uh, that inauguration, what that did is it, that kind of brought an end to the somewhat, let's call it volatile US election of 2020. OK, you know, we don't need to go back through that. I'm sure that, you know, you've been bombarded with it through uh, all sort of forms of media over the last few months. But now we're interested in this. OK, so he's in he's in the White House. What does that mean for the United States of America? And what does it actually mean for the world in general? And I'd be kind of be interested to hear what your thoughts are, okay? It's, you know, be interesting to see what are your thoughts? Do you think it's going to make the world a safer place, a more risky place? Do you think who will be the winners and losers out of Mr. Biden getting into, uh, into power? What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to share my views, okay? I'm going to share my opinions, both, you know, in terms of like, you know, sort of st stocks, sectors, but also countries, regions, et cetera, how I think what we could see happen 
over the next five to 10 years. And it's fascinating because some of you here watching this, whether you're watching this here uh, live with us today, or if you're watching this on the Admiral Markets YouTube channel later, some of you might sort of agree completely with it. Some of it might be things you've never thought about it, other things you might disagree with. And that's absolutely fine. It's those difference of opinions that actually is that's what makes a market. And so if you think that, you know, what I'm talking about here, you might see it differently please put it in the chat box or put it in the commentary box. We're very, very happy to hear it. I personally am very happy. I'm not, uh, I'm not precious about these uh, kind of uh, views and opinions. They are, they are mine, okay? And actually what being able to sort of debate it and discuss it with people is actually that's what helps sharpen your sword when it comes to actually making better choices about, you know, what, what you're going to look uh, to do in terms of your own trading and investing. So, you know, if you have a think or if you have a feel that of what you think this is going to mean for the USA and the world in general, put it in the chat box. You know, it'd be fascinating to, to hear what you uh, say and think. Uh, and we, you know, we really appreciate uh, all the kind of uh, insights. So, uh, Vincenzo, thanks. Great to see you back here. Uh, Vincenzo says uh, safer, not at all. Um, well, uh, let's uh, let's see if that uh, agrees with my own views, uh, Vincenzo. You'll see in a few uh, few particular slides. Uh, MJ, it's great to have you here. And Varen, hi, you're all super to have you here. You're very, uh, you're all very, very welcome. So, you know, let's start with a quick look at you know what's going to happen in the US, uh, and I think regardless of your views on the US election, regardless of your political views, I think it's be fair to say that everybody agree that, that President Biden he inherits a, a divided United States, okay? Rightly or wrongly, that is what he's coming to. And so what will happen, especially for him, is I believe that kind of that first 100 days will be crucial. Now, admittedly, you know, they say that whenever a president or a prime minister comes in, that the first 100 days are crucial. But I think in this case, you know, more so than ever. He has uh, inherited a kind of, as I said, a divided US, uh, a very precarious position, both in terms of like sort of geopolitical ways, but also, you know, domestically in terms of the, the sort of the uh, the violence that we've seen in the US, but also, of course, with the COVID pandemic. So how he looks to react and how he looks to, to act is going to be is going to be fascinating. And the whole world will be watching to see what he says. Now, uh, invariably, what happens is, you know, whenever a president comes in, he makes like sort of two or three executive orders on his first day. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Mr. Biden went through about a dozen, maybe even more on his first day. And a lot of that was about completely changing the uh, decisions and orders of the previous administration. So, you know, he's sort of kind of decided and committed that he will stop the border wall that was being built between the uh, US and Mexico. He is going to uh, rejoin the World Health Organization. He's also going to rejoin the Paris Agreement on, on climate uh, change. Uh, he's revoked the Keystone Pipeline between the US and Canada. Uh, and he's also uh, committed to scrapping the travel ban for uh, certain Muslims coming from certain particular countries. So he is very, very quickly wanting to sort of change what was done in the past. You might agree with that. You might not agree with that. OK, but it'll be interesting to see which which of those kind of um, which of those elements he actually embraces and grapples with and looks to make positive change in terms of doing something or which ones will actually sort of be allowed to continue to slide or which he will not uh, choose not to sort of uh, uh, to sort of take to take into battle. When we start to look into the US, and you know, I'm, I, you know, I could talk about all the different instruments, sectors, stocks, okay, areas of the US uh, all day for the rest of the week, in fact. But I'm just going to look at one or two little particular areas that might be just of interest to us to sort of take on board. Certainly, you know, we, we saw with uh, the outgoing President Trump, okay, you know, he was constantly in a uh, in a battle with social media. He was permanently barred from Facebook and uh, uh, Twitter. Uh, and invariably, he was being urged to tackle the powers that US tech uh, sector companies had. There was a great deal of uneasiness that invariably they had far too much, a uh, uh, far too much uh, uh, insight, far too much uh, kind of power, uh, and far too much the, the, the kind of their fingers had spread into everybody's everyday life. Uh, and he was being urged to sort of tackle that. Uh, personally, my own opinion, this is my personal opinion, is that uh, I don't believe that Biden will look to tackle that issue. Uh, I believe that, you know, an awful lot of those tech companies were very powerful backers 
of uh, of Mr. Biden in his uh, election campaign. Uh, and so as part of that, it'll be a case of, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Uh, and so I think it'll be unlikely that Biden might uh, would tackle them. Sure, he might have to sort of launch into a little bit of rhetoric and say a few nice speeches about it. But in terms of, you know, what, what the politicians say and what actually gets done, you know, in uh, uh, behind closed doors, I suspect it was maybe quite different. And that that's really true for all politicians around the world, isn't it? And so, you know, I think that, you know, it was one of the reasons that, you know, from Wednesday of last week, what we saw is we saw the NASDAQ rally towards its all-time highs. Okay. And we closed last week, the weekly close there. You can see the uh, you can see the chart there, okay, is that you know, we, we closed at all-time highs on NASDAQ chart because a lot of those U.S. tech companies, okay, a lot of those U.S. tech companies will have done well out of that, and in fact, as I said, you know, they were uh, they were very um, a very committed backers of Mr. Biden, and, and invariably, he's not going to do anything to upset the apple cart there. So maybe you agree with that. Maybe you think that actually, yep, you know, that's unlikely to happen. Maybe you think differently. Maybe you actually think he will. He's sort of, he'll grasp that nettle uh, and run with it. I'd be interested to know what your own particular thoughts are, you know, but that for me, when him doing that, that is kind of, you know, it's kind of bullish for certain particular tech stocks, okay? And, you know, if that's something you particularly look to, to trade and engage with, well, then by all means, you know, make sure you keep them on your uh, on your watch list. Next. Well, you know, I can't really talk about anything in the present climate without a, a touch on uh, on COVID, OK, and, and the actual pandemic. And that's that's, you know, and that once again, you know, I don't claim to be a health specialist, but it's invariably about looking at kind of the, the sort of the uh, the policy that the US has actually been following and what, if any, changes Mr. Biden will make going forward. Uh, and it's fair to say that, you know, he inherited a bit of a mixed message. Mr. Uh, Trump didn't really help himself in terms of some of his particular mixed messaging. Uh, and Mr. Biden has been very clear that, you know, the, the previous incumbent wasn't doing enough uh, and that he would make great changes as soon as he came into office. He was talking about having things like a 100-day mask challenge, whereby invariably everybody would have to wear a, a mask for the next 100 days. He, he very quickly sort of brought in that, you know, you had to uh, uh, um, wear a mask if you were on federal property, uh, and then promptly broke his own rules. But once again, it's uh, one rule for the politicians and one, another rule for the rest of us. Uh, he's also said, and this is the kind of thing that becomes interesting to us, is that he said he'll raise taxes to pay for COVID, okay? And, and uh, depending on where you look and you know, I'm not a fundamental uh, specialist, but, you know, the numbers can be anywhere between three to five trillion in terms of taxes that will be required to be raised. Uh, and invariably, that is going to weigh on many of the other stock sectors. OK, we've just looked at how the U.S. tech, particular, you know, specific elements of the U.S. tech sector might actually be OK and do well out of it. But invariably, other so sectors of the stock market they may weigh that may weigh upon when as actually he looks to actually raise taxes to to pay for his stimulus plan which came out i think about a week or so ago a few days back uh invariably he's going to have to pay for that somehow part of that will be through raising taxes that will invariably have a, a squeeze on on consumer spending so invariably companies okay who are actually sort of very sensitive to uh, the sort of kind of rise and fall in uh, in consumer confidence consumer spending that will have a knock-on impact to that so you know you can actually look at particular etf sectors that deal with that okay and uh, that might be something that we'll talk about in particular in a in a future session when we look at particular hot topics in in terms of the uh, the US economy and the kind of wider global markets Uh, Vincenzo says uh, that will pretty much destroy the US economy and advant uh, advantageous to China. Uh, that's very interesting, Vincenzo. Uh, stick with us till the very end, okay? And we'll see what uh, other elements I bring up to discuss regarding that. But uh, um, let's just say I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you on that uh, particular topic. Um, so, but, you know, we can see there's a little there, you know, uh, you know, Mr. Biden's pre-election talks was about actually he's going to get the, the virus under control. Uh, and within a day or so of being uh, elected, he's basically saying there's nothing he can do to change the trajectory that's not really a surprise okay it's, it's isn't it? as politicians you know between what they promise and what they deliver there is normally quite a gap all right but it's uh and, you know and many people would say that uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't particularly wish to be in mr biden's shoes anyway in terms of what he's inherited but it's going to be his problem to deal with and it's going to be interesting to see how he does that what he actually looks to to do to a, to, a, to sort of achieve not only sort of uh, overcoming the virus but actually also what he looks at to do in terms of the economy itself 
Well, with regards to foreign uh, the US, we've got to have a look at what happens with foreign policy. OK, what are we actually looking to sort of see from uh, Biden's team? And we have to remember, uh, you know, Joe Biden was uh, vice president during the Obama administration. And what we're seeing is a couple of the nominations are previous Obama administration people. So it's going to uh, suspect it's probably going to not look too dissimilar to what we saw from uh, Obama. Uh, and what we've seen is, you know, comments and thoughts about, you know, invariably, you know, uh, Mr. Biden, President Biden is going to reverse Trump's foreign policy in terms of uh, Trump was all about trying to get peace in the Middle East, and he wanted to bring the U.S. troops home from the Middle East, um, which is, uh, you know, on a personal basis, I could get behind that. I actually thought that was a pretty, a pretty sound sort of uh, uh, policy decision. Mr. Biden is looking to reverse that. Okay, he's looking to reverse that. He's looking to actually sort of actually uh, influx more U.S. troops into the uh, the region. Um, part of that is because the Middle East offers the easiest opportunity for for President Biden to look tough when things are going a little bit t tough at home or a little bit hard at home, and he needs to be seen to be strong. Okay, to both domestic and international audiences. Then you know having a little uh, a little bit of conflict in the Middle East is is has been very often the kind of go to playbook for U.S presidents uh, and i can actually see that uh, happening again and actually there's there's already talk of, at this weekend of elements happening that in terms of uh, in terms of what uh, u.s military was doing in the in the middle east uh, you know uh, that is just a little bit of a real politic in terms of you know the the way people are going to operate we as traders, well, that means that you want to start adding sort of defense stocks to your watch list. OK, that doesn't necessarily mean that you just go out and plump and buy, you know, the kind of the, the big defense companies. But you might want to add them to your watch list. It'll be interesting to see how they are, uh, how they uh, act, whether they are, whether they are kind of bullish or bearish uh, as we start to see Mr. Biden's foreign policy plans uh, unveil. So when we uh, look at, you know, the kind of bigger picture in terms of, well, with Mr. Biden in charge, uh, we're looking at, well, who wins? OK, who is likely to be the biggest winner from President Biden in the US? Uh, and this is my personal opinion. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, as China are likely to be the biggest winners from the uh, the election of uh, Mr. Biden. Uh, it's a case of, you know, uh, China were very um very positive supporters of uh, of Mr. Biden. Uh, it's invariably, it was kind of interesting that uh, invariably the, the, the first official message that came out of the, the Chinese Communist Party when uh, Mr. Biden had been confirmed as elected, you know, the, the first message, the official state message was invariably that you know, they congratulated Mr. Biden and they also wanted to start the renegotiation of the Trump trade deal that they had finished only sort of you know 10 11 months earlier that kind of tells you where their uh, their you know what their uh, uh, what their focus and priorities were on uh, and we're going to look at that a little bit uh, a little bit later so you know uh, vincenzo said earlier that he thought this was advantageous to china uh, i actually would would agree with you there vincenzo and maybe people here you, you might look at this and, and you think differently but i think there will be a, you know a, a kind of a, a, a dividend for backing uh, um, uh, president biden um, what we saw over this particular weekend over on Saturday and Sunday was that actually we saw that uh, the uh, Chinese Air Force invaded Taiwanese airspace uh, both Saturday morning and Sunday morning, sending aircraft into uh, into there, just into what has become uh, an increasingly little volatile piece of the uh, of the Pacific. Uh, and you know, personally, I think what, what we'll see is that China is going to leverage their Biden dividend uh, to bring Taiwan back into their fold over the next five to ten years. They've they have made no. Um, They've made no, you know, they've no secret of their uh, of their belief that Taiwan is still part of China and should you know should sort of return to the to the flock and the fold. Uh, and I can see that that today invariably will look to put pressure upon Mr. Biden to invariably allow that to happen, whether that be politically or militarily. You know, and I think that will actually has that has a knock on impact. Of should China actually achieve that in sort of bringing Taiwan back into the fold? Well, then what we'll see is that quite a few of those other countries in the Pacific, uh, including, you know, so, you know, sort of the, the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, also Australia, New Zealand, etc. Um, they will start to feel a little nervous. OK, they will feel a little nervous about that. OK, they will not necessarily be entirely comfortable about that. What does that kind of uh, how do you turn that into an opportunity? Once again, you know, you'd probably not be a, a, a long term buyer of the Taiwanese stock market at the moment, but you might actually once again have a look at uh, particular defense stocks. OK, I mean, once again, that might be something that is of, uh, is of interest to you.
So, you know, that's that's just, you know, me looking at the, the way things are happening, okay, and sort of looking at that, as I said, it's a very much bigger plan. Once again, you might disagree with me. You might actually sort of agree. You might actually have a different view. As I said, would love to hear it. It's fascinating, okay? You know, this is it's a, it's a new chapter, okay? The world is going to shift and change just because we've got a different style of, uh, of uh, US president in, but also because of the COVID pandemic and also the shifts that are going on globally within the uh, within markets and economies. And, you know, and that sort of filters through, as I said, you know, to the kind of once again, the kind of biggest winners of the uh, uh, you know, of the sort of Biden election. Uh, this is a chart of the US dollar <clears throat> against the Chinese one. Um, now, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> it uh, I, you know, I I would admit this is this is not a pair that I uh, trade myself, but I do keep an eye on it. It's part of my uh, and uh, you know part of my kind of uh, uh, analysis watch list because I want to see what the the kind of relationship is between you know, what is effectively the the sort of the two largest economies, you know, the two large kind of major superpowers. Uh, and this, as I said, is a weekly chart, and what we can see there is okay. You know, we, we had let's bring up the old drawing tool here, okay, to help do that but you know what we saw okay over sort of 2019 into early parts of 2020 is we you know we saw a really big double top reversal pattern occurring there okay uh, and if you look at that on the monthly chart it's even clearer okay to be able to see but you can see for yourself that actually what we've had is you know just a quite a tremendous okay quite a tremendous trend there okay since the kind of covid crash february march of last year we've had a quite tremendous sort of trend there a downtrend bearish trend in the dollar against the chinese one effectively you know us dollar becoming weaker chinese one becoming stronger uh, uh, normally that is not what particularly uh, um China was particularly you know keen on they're invariably happy to keep their uh, keep their uh, one pegged and keep it very very closely aligned to the US dollar because invariably what they wanted was they wanted their US uh, their exports to be ultimately cheap for for our US consumers and you know actually this actually weirdly helps them in, in another part of uh, <clears throat> another part of their purchases which is what we're going to see in the next slide or two what we have seen is you know as i said that US dollar has uh, has weakened chinese yuan has strengthened will that continue that is a very interesting question and i think we'll probably start to see hints of that over the next couple of weeks but if you think about it you know if your chinese one is getting stronger and your dollar is getting weaker how do you use that to your benefit how you know how has that sort of kind of played itself out well one of the ways we've seen that is when here this is the the purchase of soybeans okay and as part of the uh, trump trade deal uh, china committed to actually purchasing uh, purchasing american soybeans so remember you know commodities are priced in us dollars if your currency is getting stronger against the uh, the us dollar that gives you a little bit more uh, buying power when you're coming to sort of uh, buy your commodities and you can see for yourself uh, that is a, a monthly chart there of soybeans <clears throat> and you can see that having broken out of that particular trend there that has actually been quite uh, quite an astounding move there okay it was a quite astounding move up until last week okay and we'll look at that in a in a in a moment but what we can see is that invariably you know china has been on a a pretty pretty large buying spree okay in the last eight nine months both of uh, hard commodities which we'll look at a moment but also the softs the agri commodities as well <clears throat> We have seen, you know, uh, real purchasing of both uh, of both soybeans, but also of both uh, of corn as well. Uh, and this on the soybeans is, as I said, you know, this has been a very, very strong trend. And if I go down, this is now the weekly chart of uh, soybeans. And as you can see here, hopefully, you know, it was a very strong trend up until last week. OK, up until basically Mr. Uh, Biden's uh, Mr. Biden's a uh, 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 inauguration. Uh, this is soybeans. Okay, this is um, this is a uh, uh, agri commodity, uh, and you can see for yourself there. Last week's okay was price on there. That is that's a real bearish engulfing candle, a real key reversal candle. Prices pushed to new highs, but rolled over and closed beneath the low of the uh, of the previous candle. Okay, and that's a you know that's a that's a real uh, indicator that the that the trend has either come to an end or it is very close to its end. And that just kind of is an indication, you know, of you know, what, what is going on. Is that a case of, is that just a case of basically, you know, is that seasonal fluctuations? Perhaps, maybe. Is that a case of, you know, with Mr. Biden's inauguration, the Chinese have just effectively decided to ignore the uh, Trump trade deal, okay, and just basically do what they want. 
kind of interest to see these are the kind of uh, these are the kind of thoughts and comments that will come out you know as we see over the uh, over the next uh, over the next sort of a couple of weeks and months as we as we play out this particular uh, this particular trade What we also have here, as I said, is that you know the basically that that has been effectively to use uh, is as a case of uh, uh, the hard commodities. So um, the last two charts, they were both soybeans. One was a monthly chart, a commodity, uh, and the next was the soybeans on the weekly chart. And this, okay, HG futures. This is copper, copper futures. Okay, so this is a monthly chart here of uh, copper futures. And uh, hopefully, what you can see here again is once bring up the uh, let's bring up the drawing tool, is uh, effectively a case of let's bring up this. Is that we had effectively the kind of you know the COVID crash down here down to two, okay, which you can see was support previously, uh, and then we've really just been on a <clears throat> you know a fantastic uptrend there, okay. Hopefully, you can see that you know, and we started to top out, okay, uh, just under about uh, three uh, three seventy five, three seventy four. But hopefully you can see them. I mean, remember, that is a monthly chart, but you can see that that chart has basically been in one way traffic, OK, for the uh, for, for, you know, for the last nine, 10 months. All right. Uh, and what becomes interesting about that is, you know, invariably, it's a case of you know, who has been buying all of this copper. OK, uh, and invariably, once again, it's been the Chinese buying most of that copper. What impact has that had? Well, if you've joined me on, on some of the sessions I've done or looked at our uh, sessions on Traders Yard, some of the charts is that what we've seen is, you know, uh, allied with that fantastic run in uh, in copper, we've also seen a fantastic run in the Aussie dollar, okay? Invariably, there's a demand for Aussie dollar. If you're going to buy Australian exports of uh, of copper, well, then invariably, you need to pay from an Aussie dollar. That creates demand for Aussie dollar. We can see that, in fact, the uh, Australian dollar against most of the currencies over the last eight to nine months has been pretty similar to that and hopefully that kind of uh, gives you a little bit of understanding of why we've seen such strength in the aussie dollar over the uh, over the last uh, eight to, sort of eight to ten months so vincenzo says copper is fundamental for electronic electronic uh, electric infrastructures you're absolutely right okay vincenzo okay and you know copper is you know it is it's there's huge demand for it for exactly for those uh, reasons okay and so you know when it's been uh, when it's effectively has been uh, has been cheap you know it's been cheap and your currency has been uh, strong okay against the dollar remember these are mostly priced in the us dollars well then invariably it gives you an opportunity to sort of really uh, you know uh, buy a huge amount of commodities at a at a much cheaper uh, a much cheaper price so that was kind of copper but also if we have a look at this this is a monthly chart of iron ore OK, of iron ore. Once again, coming out of Australia. But as I said, this is a monthly chart. And, you know, and we can see, you know, the kind of the kind of COVID crash there down to around about $80. But hopefully you can see for yourself that actually we we've got up to just around about $170. OK, so, you know, we've, we're kind of in these last few months, the price of that has effectively doubled. OK, someone has been buying an awful lot of iron ore over the last eight to 10 months. OK, so we can see China's been buying iron ore, it's been copper, it's been buying buying soya beans, it's been buying corn, okay, it's variably been using this to effectively, you know, to, to basically to, you know, gain power on corner parts of uh, parts of commodity markets. And okay, now this is, this is kind of, you know, as traders, this is kind of, you know, it's fascinating, certainly fascinating to me, and hopefully it helps give you a little bit more of a bit of a global kind of insight as to, you know, who is likely to do the best out of the, this change, this kind of switch towards the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Biden presidency. Then we want to start to look at, you know, other areas of the world, okay, and let's get a bit close to home for, for the majority of us, okay, where we start to look at, well, okay, where does this leave Europe, where does this leave the European Union, <clears throat> excuse me, and I think it's a little bit of a mixed picture, uh, once again, historically, Historically, it would be said that invariably in the past, you know, the uh, Europe, Europe was effectively aligned with with the United States, it was part of the West, you know, shared, um, you know, kind of genetically the same, also shared sort of historic history, also shared very similar values. 
but you know as we can see uh, the european union is uh, is struggling for uh, struggling for for cash it needs money and it needs lots of it and it needs it fast um and invariably it was not really a shock to, to see that um, after the completion of the the brexit deal at the end of uh, 2020 that just a couple of days later the eu signed a uh, an agreement with china uh, as part of a bigger wider large investment deal that would invariably allow uh, not only you know uh, sort of you know particularly european companies mostly you know uh, very much like german companies to to effectively to sell into china to sell their uh, to sell their products but also to allow kind of china to sort of invest into infrastructure projects in uh, in europe uh, and so this you know regardless of those kind of let's say previous values the truth is uh, money talks and invariably what we might see over the next five, 10 years is kind of Europe, which is a little bit stuck between invariably, you know, the sort of kind of the, the US and UK on one side and sort of Russia and China on the other. I think what we'll see is actually, you know, there's a very good chance that Europe will start to edge its way more towards uh, more towards the kind of Chinese sphere of influence uh, and away from the uh, and away from the uh, uh, American one. And this is something that Biden has to deal with. This is to be interesting to see how Biden actually embraces this, you know, it, President Biden is a fan of the European Union. He has, he has always stated that. It's about whether he can turn that into actually good foreign policy and a good economic policy that basically benefits both uh, Europe and uh, the US. But Mr. Trump was very... <clears throat> What's the word should we use? Mr. Trump, he was very uh, abrasive. He was aggressive. He, you know, there was friction there in his in his particular uh, beliefs about the European Union and about the fact that the tariffs that were part of the kind of the uh, uh, economic policies of, of both kind of states. And it'll be interesting. Does Mr. Biden actually, uh, is he able to, to effectively change that? Is he effectively able to sort of bring the kind of uh, Europe back into the fold and, and actually recreate a, a strong US and, uh, and Europe? Uh, relationship and that that is something that we will uh, we'll wait to see um, and then you know we want to see well you know where does that leave the uh, the uk and i can talk about this as has been a uk citizen based here well you know you have to understand that uh, you know if you speak to mr biden he's mr biden is he's not a fan of the uk and he wasn't a fan of uh, of brexit so the the uk is likely to find itself isolated not only isolated in terms of geographical sense but also as the uh, as the kind of the us sort of focuses on uh, new parts of the world uh, and also as a uh, kind of europe maybe moves more towards uh, sort of china and russia uh, the uk will find itself somewhat isolated uh, and and this is my belief this is my view my opinion is that what will happen is that the uk will probably uh, turn towards the english speaking commonwealth and i think what we will see is that invariably you know is that invariably is that they those kind of what were once previous relationships will invariably uh, sort of be reharnessed and in particular and in particular relationships with india australia and new zealand uh, as i said a few slides earlier if there is <clears throat> if there is a, a move towards sort of taking taiwan back into the uh, uh, taking taiwan back into um, into the sort of you know into the fold of uh, of mainland China and the Communist Party, um, I think that will make countries like India, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand quite nervous, especially if they don't see Mr. Biden actually taking any uh, any real strong action and just invariably lots of uh, rhetoric. Um, that will invariably, I think, make them kind of nervous. And and, and what we will, I think we'll see is that those kind of they will start to rebuild not only just trade links but also things like um, defense and intelligence links between those nations as well as as a means of being able to sort of protect and uh, defend themselves and that all has an impact on as i said on trade between those particular uh, particular nations that all will have a no, excuse me knock on impact in terms of the the certainly the kind of cross cross currencies between those nations and, and also the sort of you know direct inward investment that carries on with that Along with that, you know, what we'll start to see is, I think, you know, we'll start to see maybe some of the Scandinavian nations will invariably, they will start to uh, sort of edge a little bit closer towards the uh, the UK. What was certainly certainly things like countries like Norway, uh, you know, they operate the uh, the F thirty five jet. Um, there's already, you know, kind of work and help and support going on there. But I think also what we'll see, Swindley, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and uh, they will also basically they will be an Iceland. They will be a uh, 
a little bit of a, a kind of a, a closer cohesion between them uh, as we see that as we see new kind of uh, alliances and allies shift uh, and, and be created and, and, and made over the next um, five to ten years. Uh, and, you know, and and finally, well, you know, there has to be the kind of question of, you know, how long will Mr. Biden govern for? Um, it's, you know, <clears throat> without without, uh, you know, being a medical specialist, if, if any of you have watched any of his particular uh, interviews or media pieces, uh, clearly, clearly the gentleman, you know, is struggling with uh, some element of cognitive decline. Uh, and then the question becomes, well, how long how long does will he see himself in the role before he's sort of uh, uh, handed over to Vice President Kamala Harris? Maybe you've got an idea on that. Maybe you've got a thought. Maybe maybe you don't think it'll happen. Maybe you think it'll happen six months, two years, four years, or never. If you have a thought on that, you know, please put it in the put it in the chat box. Okay, it makes a, an opportunity for us to have a bit of a discussion because invariably that in itself has a, a knock on impact on markets. If markets if markets sort of price in for the fact that they actually don't see Mr. Biden sort of staying in power for more than 18 months, two years, that will have huge impacts on those elements that we've just spoken about before, uh, but also about, you know, institutionals, about where invariably they would look to, to invest their own uh, their own resources, their own their own cash, their, their, you know, in, in an effort to sort of, you know, to, to be also keep them safe in terms of managing their risk, but also look for opportunity. And that will invariably have a, uh, uh, you know, a kind of, it will have an impact on what that happened. So uh, uh, Opera saying two years maximum, uh, Evelyn says only half a year will Biden be the president again. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to, to see and hear this because clearly, you know, uh, clearly it's, it's, it's not just me, clearly people are, you know, they're concerned of this. Okay. They, you know, people are thinking about this because it has, all of these knock-on impacts, okay? You know, effectively, you know, uh, you know, the the president of the United States is still seen to be the uh, president of the free world, and so in very big countries, you know, the rest of the world will look to the U.S. to see, you know, what kind of uh, the kind of the tone that they set. And if you know, if if the the average man in the street feels that Mr. Biden won't make last more than you know six to six to twenty four months, well, then invariably, you know, major politicians, major institutions, they will have that in the back of their mind, and that will have knock on impacts in terms of some of their decisions that will make. So it's you know, it's just a uh, it's a, it's a particular case. I have absolutely no doubt that President Biden will get the finest medical treatment you know available to to humanity. But invariably, the just you know the 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 kind of the job, the, the the intensity, the stress, the pressure of this particular job of being president of the US at this particular time is going to be interesting to see what kind of impact that has on him and actually what happens in the US with that. And I think that will that is going to be a uh, unfortunately that's going to be a, a story that doesn't go away. That's always going to be in in the back of people's minds. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, you know, Mr. Biden became President Biden last Wednesday, the 20th of January. We can see, as we spoke earlier, that there's going to be many changes happening from the previous administration. OK, well, you know, regardless of your um, political views or thoughts, OK, there, are, there is changes afoot and those changes will have knock on impacts into uh, into global markets. We think that it's likely to be good for tech stocks, okay, in the initial uh, in the initial swing, mainly because of you know, Mr. They were backed, Mr. Biden was backed very heavily, okay, by uh, by a lot of those U.S. tech companies. So he's unlikely to uh, to sort of uh, uh, wrap them on the knuckles. We can also see that there's a good chance that defense stocks should be added to your watch list <clears throat> because you know Mr. Biden's going to need to to be seen to be tough, okay? Uh, you know, in parts of the world, uh, and also there will be problems in other parts of the world that will make companies nervous, uh, and they will invariably be looking to sort of ensure that they are uh, uh, have a good defense. But of course, with COVID and with that, with you know this kind of nervousness, that has a, an impact on other uh, U.S. stock sectors in particular. And to be true, that is likely to happen to most of okay, the economies across the developed Western world. It might be different in, in your part of the world, wherever you join us from. But the likelihood is, you know, the, the kind of the uh, the sort of the stimuluses that we have uh, across the West have created to sort of get off get ourselves through that pandemic. Uh, they're going to have to be paid back in one way or another. And so we are unlikely to see stock uh, taxes rise. It's more a question of how soon will those taxes rise? I don't think it's going to be immediately. Uh, I think it will probably be at, towards the end of this year, but they will happen and that will have an impact on stock markets. And, and some of the particular stock sectors, 
things like you know consumer uh, spending that is going to have a, a huge impact on that we've seen that uh, commodities have been on the rise okay in both you know hard commodities and soft commodities uh, and a lot of that has been driven by china who uh, we believe will probably be the the biggest winner from the uh, uh, the biggest winner from the kind of uh, the biden uh, election mr biden's going to have lots of problems to deal with at home and abroad uh, and that will allow sort of you know china to effectively to 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 further their own particular uh, policies and ideas and concepts and that's what i think we will see happening over the uh, the next uh, a few years. We've certainly seen it, you know, in, in last year, we saw uh, Asian GDP uh, combined was, was for the first time was actually greater than the than GDP in the West. Uh, and we also saw that the, the the kind of forecasts for, you know, when China would overcome the, uh, the US to become the number one economy. Uh, uh, previously, that had been in this kind of mid 2030s decade. Uh, now they're looking at it happening at around about 2028, only only seven years away now. So changes afoot, ladies and gentlemen. And the question is, you know, is how do we turn that into uh, into an opportunity? So um, I, I hope you found that uh, a useful. I hope it's giving you a little bit of food for thought. As I said, <clears throat> you might have heard some of those views. You might agree with some of them. Some of it might be completely new. Maybe you've not given it consideration. Other ideas you might think, well, do you know what, Paul? That's that I disagree, and and that is absolutely fine because it is those opinions that make a market. And if you have thought or you know about it, you know, if you're watching this later on the YouTube channel, please by all means, by all means, feel free to sort of you know drop us a note, a comment on the YouTube channel, put a uh, piece up in the chat box, and you'll find that you know we happily to sort of engage and sort of you know uh, and understand because we appreciate that uh, that's what makes for a uh, that's what makes for an interesting market. Uh, and, you know, and if you want to sort of, you know, if you want to sort of get in touch with us, you can do so. The email there is at global at uh, admiralmarkets.com. Or as I said, you can be able to contact us, youtube.com forward slash admiralmarkets, where you'll see not only this video, but all of the whole archive of the Trading Spotlight uh, webinars over the last 18 months. Uh, and you can follow us on facebook.com forward slash uh, admiralmarkets uh, global. So, uh, um, as I said, you know, it's fantastic to have had you here to join us. I hope it's given you some uh, fascinating food for thought uh, to take away and sort of to start to think about as as you look for kind of longer term uh, opportunities. Gives us, you know, it's going to be, as I said, an interesting opportunity, interesting kind of year uh, as part of the next few years. There will always be opportunity around and it's, it's important for traders to be uh, well educated and savvy about you can do it. And, and hopefully here at the Admiral Markets and the Trading Spotlight webinars, they will just help give you a little bit of insight and uh, guidance on the uh, on the way forward. So, uh, as always, I wish you the very best of success in your own trading endeavors. Uh, I look forward to speaking to you uh, uh, next week. And uh, uh, and for those of you, you know, I'll be in Traders Yard this afternoon to answer your uh, answer your question. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thanks, Opera. Great to have you here. Tina, you're very welcome. Uh, and Andre, that was, uh, you're very welcome. Okay. And uh, thank you. Can uh, Thanks for joining us. Thanks for uh, having it. Claudia, you're very, very, uh, you're very welcome. Okay. I'm glad you, uh, glad you found that uh, useful. And as I said, wish you the best of success in your own trading and we'll, uh, we'll speak to you soon. Many thanks.